It's a great honor to talk about Alexander von Humboldt, our planet's first planetary thinker. He was born 201 years ago today, and he's been dead since 1859. What's his relevance to us today? What's his proper place as we enter the third decade of the 21st century? Humboldt's place, as he often reminded us, is on a small but wondrous planet, the third one orbiting a small star in the Milky Way galaxy amid a vast and mostly empty universe. Those of us living on this planet today are faced with a fundamental question. How do we live together? This breaks down into two more specific questions. How do we live together as people? People of different colors, genders, ethnicities, languages, nationalities, cultures, beliefs. How do we, as a species with remarkable intelligence and capacities, but equally remarkable short-sightedness and incapacities, live together with all the other species that inhabit this world? I needn't remind you how consequential these questions are today. These questions also concerned Alexander von Humboldt. He's most familiar to us as a scientist, but if we perceive Humboldt solely as a scientist, we'll fail to understand him and we'll miss what he has to offer us. He thought of himself primarily as a humanist. My purpose today is to reveal both these facets of Humboldt. Let's start with the familiar. Humboldt made important contributions across the length and breadth of the natural and social sciences. There are few disciplines, none in the environmental sciences, that can't trace fundamental ideas back to Humboldt. Humboldt made vital contributions both before and after his journeys to the New World in 1799 through 1804 to biogeography and ecology. Humboldt was fascinated by the biological marvels of our planet. He reveled in the diversity of life as he collected, described, and documented thousands of new species. His first major work after his travels in the Americas was his 1807 essay on the geography of plants, which laid out a vision for a comprehensive science of the earth, which he called Physique Générale du Monde or a general physics of the earth. The bulk of the essay on the geography of plants was a 26,000 word caption for this now famous profile of Chimborazo in Ecuador. Here and elsewhere, Humboldt placed vegetation at the center, both literally and conceptually. He recognized that vegetation is the critical intermediary between the land and the sky. It's influenced directly by the atmosphere, and it affects not only the physics and chemistry of the atmosphere, but also the soils, hydrology, runoff, erosion, and the overall shape and texture of the land surface. Humboldt recognized that human destruction or alteration of vegetation would have consequences for the atmosphere, for the waters, and for the land surface of the earth. On his visit in 1800 to Lake Valencia, he noted the extensive recent deforestation and cultivation and connected this to the decreasing lake water levels reported by his hosts. He said, the destruction of forests, the clearing of plains and the cultivation of indigo have reduced within half a century, the quantity of water flowing in to the lake on the one hand and on the other hand, the evaporation of the soil and the dryness of the atmosphere explain the successive diminution of the Lake of Valencia by felling the trees that cover the tops and the sides of mountains. Men in every climate prepare at once two calamities for future generations, the want of fuel and a scarcity of water, the destruction of forests, the want of permanent springs, and the existence of flood torrents are three phenomena closely connected together. Humboldt recognized that in order to understand our planet, we need planetary networks of coordinated and synchronized observations of atmospheric, oceanographic, geophysical, and ecological phenomena. 
This required unprecedented international cooperation among scientists. Humboldt organized an international network of geomagnetic observatories in the 1830s and helped do the same for meteorology and oceanography in the following decades. Now, it's important to note that Alexander von Humboldt, like all scientists, did not accomplish everything alone or in a vacuum. He drew from countless conversations, voluminous correspondence, and extensive readings, as well as his own firsthand observations throughout his long career. Many of the central elements of Humboldt's thinking were well developed before he left for the Americas in 1799. He was personally and intellectually close to his brother Wilhelm, who was an influential philosopher, linguist, and diplomat. Humboldt's holistic thinking and his interest in the arts and in form owed much to his close friend, the romantic poet and essayist Goethe, who also wrote extensively on physics, botany, and morphology. Humboldt and Goethe spent many hours discussing their mutual interests in the arts and the sciences. His ideas about epistemology, ethics, and geography drew from Prussian philosopher Immanuel Kant. Humboldt's botanical mentor, Karl Wildenau, thought extensively about plant species distributions and their climate determinants and passed them on to Humboldt. And finally, George Forrester, another friend who had accompanied Captain James Cook on his second voyage to the South Pacific, shared his ideas about climate, vegetation, and geography with Humboldt. Humboldt was accompanied for the entire journey by botanist Aimé Bonplan, who walked with Humboldt from Marseille to Madrid, then traveled with him for nearly five years in the Americas, observing, collecting, and conversing all the while. In the Americas, Humboldt engaged with local savants and naturalists who shared their local and regional knowledge while eagerly absorbing Humboldt and Bonplan's updates on European science. Among them were José Celestino Mutiz, a Spanish immigrant to Bogotá who was one of the great naturalists of the time, and Francisco José Caldas, a brilliant self-taught native of Popillán whose life and work were cut short by his execution by the Spanish forces during the Bolivarian Revolution. And Humboldt also learned from all the other diverse people he encountered on his journeys. He was a keen listener. Back in Paris, Humboldt employed hundreds of laborers, technicians, and artists who made possible the 45 volumes of his lavishly illustrated Voyage of Humboldt and Bonplan. Consider the labor involved in rendering all of their original pressed specimens, field notes and sketches into pencil drawings, then to hand colored ink drawings, then to lithographic plates to produce the hundreds of hand colored plates in the 20 botanical folios. I turn now to Humboldt as a humanist, again, merely sampling a stunningly broad and deep set of contributions. Humboldt, was an impassioned, militant, and influential opponent of slavery. His revulsion is clear in public writings and statements throughout his lifetime and in his personal correspondence. His 1826 book on Cuba includes extensive passages that describe the injustices of slavery and called for its abolition in Cuba, Brazil, and the United States. In 1856, just before the American Civil War, an English translation was published in the United States, which expunged Humboldt's discussion of slavery and obscured his opposition to it. The translator, John Thrasher, was pro-slavery and advocated openly for the annexation, or if necessary, military conquest of Cuba by the United States to make it a new slave state. Upon seeing that volume, Humboldt was furious, writing a public letter published widely across the world in protest. I owe it to a moral feeling publicly to complain that in a work which bears my name, the entire chapter has been arbitrarily omitted. To this very portion of my work, I attach greater importance than to any astronomical observations experiments of magnetic intensity or statistical statement. Humboldt went on to write, we can never praise enough the new republics 
of Spanish America, which since their birth have been seriously occupied with the total extinction of slavery. That region has an immense advantage over the southern part of the United States, where the whites during the struggle with England established liberty for their own profit and where the slave population to the number of 1,600,000 augments still more rapidly than the white. And Humboldt was a great admirer of the United States, but he was also critical, particularly of slavery. He was publicly critical of the various pro-slavery laws, policies, and practices that emerged in the United States between the 1820s and 1850s. In 1857, he used his influence with the Prussian King and Ministry of Justice to enact a law that granted automatic freedom to any enslaved person entering Prussia or any of its jurisdictions. Coincidentally, that law was enacted the same month as the notorious court decision in the Dred Scott case, which denied freedom to any enslaved person entering the free states of the U.S. In the early to mid 19th century, numerous physicians, anthropologists, and naturalists wrote extensively about race science, often using it as an explicit justification for slavery and colonialism. Many argued that human races comprise separate species that cannot or should not be allowed to interbreed. Others acknowledged that all humans were a single species, but distinguished races as immutable categories arranged in a hierarchy. It should come as no surprise that white people or Northern Europeans were always ranked at the top. Humboldt wrote in 1845, the distribution of mankind is only a distribution into varieties, which are commonly designated by the somewhat indefinite term races. We fail to recognize any typical sharpness of de definition or any general or well-established principle in the division of these groups. From the 1810s until his death in 1859, Humboldt was the most influential voice in the global scientific community arguing for the unity and equality of humankind. He wrote, while we maintain the unity of the human species, we at the same time repel the depressing assumption of superior and inferior races of men. All are in like degree destined for freedom. Humboldt's death was followed a few months later by publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, which along with Darwin's later works on variation and sexual selection solidified the empirical foundations for Humboldt's argument about the unity and equality of humankind. Humboldt wrote admiringly of the agricultural, architectural, artistic, and technological accomplishments of indigenous peoples in the Andes and Mexico, he generally spoke of indigenous people with curiosity and respect, wrote passionately about the impacts of conquest, massacre, disease, and cultural disruption by Europeans, and was outspoken about ongoing mistreatment by government, clergy, military, and economic policies. He noted in speaking of the natives of Mexico, we ought to be infinitely circumspect in pronouncing on the moral or intellectual dispositions of the nations from which we are separated by the multiple obstacles imposed by differences in language and of manners and customs. How should a traveler arrogate to himself the right of deciding on the different faculties of the soul on the preponderance of reason, wit, or imagination among nations? Women were seldom seen or heard in intellectual discourse of Humboldt's time. It's significant that Humboldt was a strong supporter of some of the most successful women scholars and scientists of his time, including Helen Maria Williams, Mary Somerville, Caroline Herschel, and Maria Mitchell. Humboldt himself never married and appears never to have had a romantic relationship with a woman. Some of his letters indicate he was physically attracted to men, and it's likely he was homosexual in orientation, though details remain obscure. Humboldt was strongly critical of colonialism. 
He noted that the idea of the colony itself is an immoral idea. All colonial government is a government of mistrust. He also had a very strong sense for his time and class of social justice, liberty, and democracy. He led the funeral procession for the 254 Berlin citizens who died in the uprising of 1848. And in 1849, during the repressive backlashes that occurred across Europe in reaction to the aborted revolutions of 1848, he wrote a friend, 1849 is the year of reaction. I have saluted 1789, and now at the age of 80, I am reduced to the worn out hope that the fine and ardent wish for free institutions is maintained in the people, that periodically it may appear to be asleep, but that it is eternal as the electromagnetic storm which sparkles in the sun. So we've reviewed Humboldt as a scientist and as a humanist, but perhaps most important in understanding him is that he was both a scientist and a humanist at the same time, that he had an integrated vision for the sciences and the humanities. He viewed them as inseparable aspects of the human experience. This is best articulated in his great unfinished work, Cosmos, where he noted that the sciences and the humanities are both necessary and complementary ways of understanding our world. Science, in the absence of aesthetics or emotions, is sterile. He wrote Cosmos specifically to combat what he called vicious empiricism. And then flipping it, he noted that the arts, without informed understanding of the world in which we find ourselves, the world outside our cultures and civilizations, is ignorant and self-centered, and that to properly understand and appreciate this world, we need both the sciences and the humanities. So where is Alexander von Humboldt today? You can find him in stone or bronze in parks all over the world. And I certainly hope that a child playing in Tower Grove Park this weekend will wonder who he was and look him up on her cell phone. Maybe she'll become a scientist someday. We should, of course, be skeptical of all people on pedestals. Humboldt was by no means perfect. Like every human who's ever lived or ever will live, he was trapped in his time and place. He was an aristocrat. He could be arrogant. He could be elitist. He accepted advantages, privileges, and gifts from wealth, power, and colonialism. He served the Prussian monarchs, the Spanish king, the Russian czar. He accepted the hospitality of slaveholders, colonists, imperialists. He looted an indigenous gravesite. But nobody of his century or any century is perfect, judged by contemporary standards. And we can't escape that we're the intellectual descendants of all those flawed people who came before us. So where is Alexander von Humboldt today? Well, certainly you can find him in libraries and bookstores and you should go look for him there. His most important works remain in print in English, French, German, and Spanish. I encourage you to read them. You'll find treasures there. Where is Alexander von Humboldt today? What's his place in our world? Well, his proper place is right here in our minds. He's already there. You can't be a biogeographer without having Humboldt's ideas engraved in your mind. But he should be there more explicitly and deliberately because his integrated vision of the sciences and his integrated vision of the sciences and humanities are so fundamentally necessary for us today. Humboldt was a public intellectual. He was versatile in his employment of different rhetorical approaches, technical monographs, travelogues, memoirs, editorials, allegories, essays. He used a variety of creative visualizations to get his ideas across. Maps, charts, statistical graphics, technical drawings, visual arts. 
Humboldt was an integrator and a boundary spanner. He bridged the various and diverse sciences. He bridged the sciences and the humanities. He bridged nations. He bridged cultures. Humboldt was an advocate. He advocated for the critical role of science in supporting an open and prosperous society and reciprocally for the need for an open society to be able to foster science and the effective advancement of knowledge. Finally, Alexander von Humboldt was a disruptor. He saw that naturalistic rationales were being used to justify injustices such as slavery, racism, oppression, colonialism, monarchy. So he developed naturalistic arguments and approaches and assembled evidence to undermine those hierarchies. Building on his legacy, we should ask ourselves, what's being naturalized today? I conclude with our initial question. How do we live together on this planet of wonders? Engagement with Humboldt's life and work can help us see further, help us ask the right kinds of questions, and with diligence and some luck, help set us on a path toward a better future for humanity and for nature. Thank you.